Dude, how come every time I'm taking off a backpack or putting one on, I feel like I'm doing the chicken dance and my watch gets caught up? It. Hey guys, welcome to Gear Tasting. Today we're going to start off talking about the Exo Mountain Gear K2 2000 pack. And I'll explain some reasons why I think it might be a solid contender for the Mammoth Sniper Challenge that I do every year and why it might replace my Alice pack. All right, so for those of you that have been following kind of the progression that I've had with competing in the Mammoth Sniper Challenge, you'll know that ounces are a premium. So I was very intrigued when I learned about this Exo Mountain Gear pack and they reached out about us taking a look at one and evaluating one. Primarily that means me actually putting a gun in it, seeing how it operates and how the fit and function go in regards to what I'm used to doing with the Mammoth Sniper Challenge, which is carrying a significant amount of weight over a long period of time. So really what the biggest thing that drew me to this was not only the fact that I could carry a gun and they have a dedicated weapon carrier attachment for this pack, but the biggest draw was that this is this comes in at like four and a half pounds, which beats the Alice by roughly almost two and a half pounds. So that's huge. Like to be able to take two and a half pounds of weight and put it into other gear and equipment and food and hell hand warmers. That was a big thing last year that I wish I would have had more of. Rob and I were just talking about that. He was like, did you take hand warmers? I'm like, yeah, I took as many as I could, which was two. That's the, that's the limit. It's like, that was my one ounce, two ounce limit of hand warmer. So I'm very intrigued buy this pack for that reason. Now, I also think there's a way you, I could probably even shave off a little more weight with this pack if I cut down straps and things like that once I had all this pack, once I had this pack all configured. So, I literally just opened it out of the box today. I started messing with the configuration. It maybe took me about, you know, 20, 30 minutes tops to kind of learn the intricacies of how this pack operates and to get my gun into it to kind of show you guys what um, how I would probably configure it. So obviously I haven't carried any weight in this pack. I'm pretty sure that everything is going to fit. This is a, a, a 2000 pack, as I mentioned earlier. The, the 2000, I believe, is related to the cubic inches that this pack is. I would assume that anyway. But the, the overall construction of this is a, is a blend of Cordura. This looks like probably a uh, a lighter weight, either 500 Cordura. I don't think it's as tough as a 1,000 denier Cordura. It looks like a 500. Then it's got this four-way stretch material that's in the, the side pockets for carrying a Nalgene, which intrigues me too. That's something I don't have on the Alice. You know, I, that's something I, I didn't run at all. I didn't even run a hydration bladder. Um, one was because the temperature was dropping considerably and I didn't want my hydration bladder to freeze and things like that. But um, kind of getting off on a tangent there. So the big thing that, that this pack offers is flexibility. So what I like that, that I just kind of figured out too when I had this on is that if I were to ground this pack when I came in from a stage at Mammoth after a, you know, a long hike, you know, I, can, I can ground the pack, I can undo these buckles. So these buckles allow me here to lift the whole day pack off the gun itself. So the gun kind of stays in a scabbard configuration against the frame itself. And the frame is made out of titanium, so it's, it's pretty light. Um, you know, and you can adjust this too. It looks like it's moving around a little bit, but that would be a little more tighter as I, you know, configured this more. And I might, might pass the strap underneath the scope too, so it's not on top of it. But, um, you know, the gun stays in here. And as you can see, kind of with the day pack too, it passes underneath this part of the day pack right there and into uh, the weapon carrier. So that's a big plus for me. That means I can open this up. I can, you know, get into the pack as I need to. Uh, it's got a roll top, which is kind of an interesting configuration. Uh, it's got kind of a gasket material on the top here so that when you put it together and roll it down, you get a little bit of, of waterproofness. And this is, this is also a coated Cordura too, so you get some kind of inherent water resistance with that Cordura. So in the day pack itself, it's got a, a large zipper in the back, and these are all waterproof zippers. So this zipper is waterproof right here. 
Um, this main zipper for this compartment here, which they call a spotting scope pocket, or actually I think the smaller one on the front is the spotting scope pocket, but that's got a large waterproof zipper around this side too. So um, this pass is not really a passer, it's more like a, a pocket. So this is a, you know, a, a, a soft material pocket here. And you'll see that as I open this pocket up. So these are some, some straps in the front, which, you know, I'm, I, I'd be tempted to cut those off just for weight reduction, but it would also be a great place to put the, the tripod from the spotting scope too, is, as you're carrying a, you know, a load for a precision rifle event like that. So the outside of the pocket here kind of fillets open like this, and now you have access to the, the interior compartment here. So it's a big, large compartment, but then in the top here, as you can see, so there's that soft pocket, but then there's, there's a pocket in the back as well as a hanger right here for hanging a hydration bladder. So the way that looks kind of from the inside here is like so. So you got your hydration bladder pocket, you can hang it so it doesn't fall all the way down to the bottom. So that's the, the interior configuration. Then as you move outside, it's got this smaller pocket here, you know, that's kind of got a, a bellows in it and it can fit a, a spotting scope or something like that. So again, you zip this up, just like so. And you would then buckle all this together. There's lots of buckles and straps in this pack. That's one thing it, it does have on it. So then I would secure this like so, attaching the, the pack to the frame body. And I can roll down the top, which I should have done already. And then the way I have this configured here is that I've kind of got a cross strap type thing with this. So the pack lid kind of crosses like this and is able to be adjusted around the barrel a little bit of the gun. So that's the way it would look on the front. And, you know, I was kind of playing around with having this pack on and moving a little bit with it. Obviously, there's not a ton of weight in it other than the gun, but it does feel very comfortable. I did find out that I needed to adjust this which is very easy. It's got these adjustment buckles on the sides. So you can move the shoulder pads or the shoulder straps up and down this track to adjust the height of the shoulder straps. And then it's got a pretty chonga size, uh, I guess, kind of a, a pad back here for the small of your back to where, which is where the weight should be carried anyway when you're carrying a pack. It should be carried on your hips. So large size belt pad too. It's, uh, it's, they make some accessories that can fit onto the waist strap as well. So then there's that weapon carrier hanging down. And I, I like the fact that it's not right up against the butt pad. So it's kind of, you know, further up a little bit because that all kind of depends on where it, where it hangs from. So it actually hangs from these bottom straps here, which this system is a little intricate when you adjust it, but once you have it all adjusted, it's, it's pretty good to go. So that's just kind of a quick walkthrough from the you know, and the Exo Mountain Gear Pack. I'm obviously going to keep using this. I want to get some hikes in with it with some weight and see how it kind of handles itself too. But I do really feel like it's a, it's a huge contender for what I would take the Mammoth. Primarily what I really love about this too that I kind of neglected to mention is that at Mammoth with the Alice Pack, I have to carry my gun horizontally on my back. So, you know, I'm, I'm basically muzzle sweeping a bunch of people when I'm carrying my gun on the top of that Alice Pack. And it's it's one of those weird things that I was really not comfortable with going into the, the first time I competed two years ago, but it's a very common occurrence there and everyone just kind of, you know, trusts that your weapon is safe and, you know, kind of goes about it, goes about their business. So I, I've never really liked that though. And it's a little tough to move in and out of certain stages because the rifle can get hung on certain things. So I really like it more being in a vertical configuration, but from what I've seen out there on the marketplace, this is the lightest pack that allows me to do this. Um, other packs out there that can carry a gun vertically in a scabbard and things like that, um, one, either don't have enough room in the pack or two, are super heavy, like seven, eight pounds of pack. So I was really stoked to hear that this was only four and a half.
All right, let's do some questions over coffee. Today I am drinking Mustang Blend from Got Your Six Coffee, and I'm very much enjoying it. They roast their own beans, so that's a huge plus for me. I'm really, uh, I'm fond of this coffee so far. We've just been drinking it, and I also like the fact that they donate a significant amount of their profits to military and law enforcement and first responder type charities, so that's a huge plus in my book. First question today, comes from Jonathan K on Facebook. I've seen the video and articles about the strongest coat hangers. Sorry, it's a good copy. And the gear stand you've made, is it safe to hang a plate carrier with plates in it, no soft armor on those types of hangers for a long time or will it cause damage in the long term? So, you will not cause damage to the plates by hanging plates in a carrier. What might happen is your carrier might deform. So basically there's, if your shoulder straps have any kind of memory and nylon does have um, some kind of uh, memory that'll, that'll occur if you stretch nylon. So if you hang something with significant weight on a, a rack or a, you know, a hanger, um, you do run the risk of having that happen. Especially if you have kind of like neoprene shoulder pads, they can develop kind of a crease or a memory and then you might deal with you know those not laying flat as you're wearing the plate carrier later on. So, and then also I guess in the bottom of the plate carrier, however the attachment is to actually hold the plate in at the bottom of the carrier, because most carriers that's where you insert the plates from, uh, you may run the risk of that. But I also want to address something that you know you bring up too, and you say that um, there's no soft armor, and there's I assume you know the reason behind why you shouldn't hang soft armor in. NIJ standards, which are typically uh, the rating on a, yeah, this is, so this, this particular uh, soft armor from Velocity Systems mentions an NIJ 2005 requirement. So the NIJ is kind of the body that sets up some standards that body armor is judged by or tested by. So it, it specifically says in those standards not to hang it from a hanger is what it says, I believe, but uh, the actual quote which I put in here is that it reduces effectiveness. So they don't really say what that means, they just say it reduces effectiveness. So what I assume by that is that, you know, in standard soft armor plates, you're dealing with layers of Kevlar. So if you were to press this, you know, and hang it, and the Kevlar starts bending and warping over time in the heat and things like that, whether that's in the bottom of a carrier, you know, curling or something like that, it can reduce the, the effectiveness because of the, the crease that could develop in Kevlar, or now it's you know, offset off your body or something like that, and now the bullet's going here instead of being you know, protected if your armor was here. So that's what I assume is the reason. I'll link to those standard, the NIJ mention of the, the hanger too, but um, some, of the, some of the coat hangers that you mentioned in here, the world's toughest coat hanger, is the, the one we started out reviewing on ITS a long time ago. I'm still a huge fan of these things. Uh, this has is, this is come along, they've been along, around for a long time, but they're, you know, they're made in the US, and I've long been a fan of the, the world's strongest coat hanger. But then the Tough Hook came out a while back too, which allows you to kind of flip the hanger around to carry body armor too, so that's an interesting thing. I actually did a video a long time ago of doing a pull-up from one of these and it didn't break, so. Um, they're, uh, they're both really good options for coat hangers. You can kind of see the, the width difference between them and the basic styles and shapes. So hopefully that gives you a little insight into body armor and storing it and hanging it. I always keep my uh, soft armor laying flat. So I'll store it flat and I'll stack it on top of each other. So I have a couple of different sets and those are all kind of stacked together. Uh, and it's in the warehouse. I, you know, they should probably be in a climate controlled area, uh, but they're not and that's how I have them stored. Okay, next question comes from Grant Yu on Facebook. I was wondering if you could talk and compare, uh, talk about and compare some different IR strobes. I'm really interested in your opinions on the VIP IR strobe from Adventure Light and the Mana strobe from SNS Precision, which I happen to have here to talk about. I'm suggesting both to my unit and was looking for more pros and cons of each and your thoughts. So um, I can give you my thoughts on them. I've never used an IR strobe other than uh, kind of IFF usage for uh, hog hunting and things like that. So when I was in the service, I never had much uh, 
experience using IR strobes, so I can't really comment on that aspect of them. But I can give you my pros and cons basically from a, a device perspective in, in my usage of them. So first off, they both have a similar function. So the they're both kind of an IR strobe for IFF, identification, friend or foe. And they both have an IR function. So the, the IR function on both of these is determined by a dial click. So the, the VIP IR is mounted in a configuration something like this. And by just turning this, you, you're now in IR mode. So one turn uh, clockwise on the VIP IR, and you're now in IR mode. And um, you can look really closely because these IR uh, LEDs are a little bit visible, so you can kind of see if the, the IR mode is intact. So that's a little bit of the downside with this because there's, there's something with the MANA strobe from SNS Precision that will give you some feedback as to whether it's in IR mode, and I'll talk about that in a second. But then another click on this in a clockwise fashion turns on the, the solid green uh, triple LEDs. So, and then another turn turns on the flashing uh, green LEDs. So it's got a strobe feature in uh, visible, and it's got a strobe feature in IR. So the IR is a strobe, and and VIP, uh, yeah, VIP signal lights makes a lot of different options for these little VIP strobes. So there's there's ones that don't have IR. There's ones that are red and blue and green, and there's all kinds of options with this. So. That's one thing that I really like about the VIP strobes is that you do have a lot of options with them. They, both of these units take a 123, um, just to, and I'm not downing the mana strobe yet, I just haven't talked through that yet. The, the battery is a 123, you unscrew this little compartment here, and you've got the 123 battery, a single 123, and you put this back in. The VIP strobes have a lot of different accessories as well that interact with the, uh, the IR strobe, so, or the VIP strobe. So you can get a battery door replacement that's got a little magnetic lead on it so that it can turn it into a tripwire, so that you can turn it to IR mode or visible strobe or you know, visible steady light. And once that little magnet gets pulled away from the body on a tripwire, it can, it can set off the strobe and basically give you a visual feedback that someone's in the area or something like that. So that's a huge benefit in my mind of the, of the VIP IR light. Um, and then it's got these little mounting holes here and here. You can either take a zip tie or I put a piece of paracord through there kind of as a dummy cord, you know, to, to tie it around a strap uh, if I'm mounting it. So it's got this clip on the back like this. And it's got two holes if you want to mount it or you want know, clip it into your gear or something like that. Uh, so then they have a lot of accessories too for mounting options as well. So it kind of it can fit into a little carrier uh, that's got uh, yeah it's got hook on the back. You can put it on a helmet or something like that too. So you're not limited to gear placement with this. So the accessories they make allow you to you know put it on a helmet or so on and so forth. You could always put your own hook on the back of it too. Um, you're just going to deal with it not being a, you know, the potential for it falling off or the hook coming unstuck or something like that too. So, and then moving on to the SNS Precision one, the back of this has as hook as well. So you can put this right on top of a, a helmet, and that's really what it's built for. So you can kind of see the contour right here that would go on kind of this area of the helmet. So mainly it's for IFF recognition, wearing helmets and things like that, but. SNS does have, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly, they do have an attachment for this that you can mount it onto molly webbing and things like that too. So you're not just limited to the hook backing on this. And then this has got a small pass-through on the front. You can't really see it right there, but the small pass-through in the front allows you to put a piece of uh, dummy cord or something through there so that you also have a way of tying it down so that if it does come unstuck from the Velcro, you're not going to lose it because these are roughly... 200 and some odd dollars, and I think the VIPs in the IR configuration are somewhere, uh, I don't know, I don't want to misquote that because I really don't know the price, but I do know that these are at least 200 bucks uh, from SNS. So the, vi the feedback on this, once you turn it on, which is through that button, this button on the back, once you turn it on, I don't know if you can hear that, but that little three vibrations on it uh, it's a vibrating motor inside, and it's a triple vibration, and it tells you that it's now operating in IR mode. Obviously, you can't see it because it's in IR mode. 
And if you squeeze these two buttons simultaneously, so there's a button on this side and a button on that side, and if you hold it down for a few seconds, now it goes into strobe mode, invisible. So now that's your visible strobe. All you do to turn that off is just press, depress the button on the back again, and now, it, now it's back to, it resets it. So now if you push the button again, let's see if I can put this next to the mic. So now that's your feedback again for it. So, and I just turned it off again. So that's the deal with uh, the SNS Precision Mana Strobe versus the, the VIP light from VIP Signal Light. I think it's Adventure Lights. Yeah, sorry. Adventure Lights is the name of the company. I kind of messed that up. Pro apologize. So adventurelights.com, and I think it's snsprecision.com. You can check these two things out uh, if you're interested in these signal lights. Okay, last question comes from Scully Lone Wolf. That's L-O-A-N Wolf. So I'm not really sure where that name comes from, but yeah. Question is, my girlfriend and I want to go hiking and camping. With a budget of $500 for gear, what do you recommend we buy? I recommend you take that $500 and use it for travel uh, to get to the destination you want to go hiking and camping at. Uh, honestly, I would set aside a small portion of that and buy a cheap tent and something to sleep on in the tent and call it a day and see if you guys even like doing that together. So before you go blow $500 on getting all this equipment together, and I can recommend things, but you'll eat up that budget pretty quick uh, because I, I kind of am more of the philosophy of buy once, cry once type thing. So I like recommending quality stuff that's not gonna fall apart. Whereas in this case, I'm recommending cheap shit that you might not, <laughs> that might not last on you. So. Uh, when it comes to tents, you want to make sure that camping is something you want to do. So I went through the gamut of learning through experience of having a cheap tent, having it rain, having the seams leak, trying to seal those and not working and buying a tent that's more expensive that has uh, already sealed seams on it. So those are just kind of trial and error lessons you learn through time of camping and hiking and things like that. And it really, hiking and camping is really one of those things where you could, you could watch YouTube videos all day. I can recommend all this stuff to you, but at the end of the day, it's really what's gonna work for you and what's in your budget. So go out camping, you know, start sleeping on some blankets at the bottom of the tent and realize, hey, this sucks. I need something that's gonna get me off the ground. So you might want a huge tent that has the ability to put cots in it. You might want to put an inflatable mattress in it. That's the kind of camping you might want to do. Uh, you might just want a, you know, a high density foam ground pad so that it protects you a little bit more at night. But it's really going to be dependent on what style of camping you guys are up for too. Is it car camping? Is it tent camping? Is it truly hiking in with all your gear into a remote location and, you know, backpacking uh, into that and then, you know, dealing with weight and constraints that way where you have to pack in what you pack or pack out what you pack in and that type of stuff. So um, that's my little soapbox on that question. Hopefully that helps you. Uh, be sure to uh, let us know where you go camping at. By the way, that wasn't because I'm going to stalk you to see where you go camping at. I'm just curious to know what kind of environment you guys wind up in. Was that also creepy? Hey guys, thanks for watching Gear Tasting. Today I have a special announcement, which is that we're now on Patreon. So if you know anything about Patreon, it's a way to get some support from you guys out in the audience and then give you some perks in return. So very much like I've talked about before with the membership we do on ITS, but we're going to try out using Patreon as a way to meet some goals that we have for the channel. So we've never not had the goal to grow our channel, but we do need some some support funding wise to be able to do a lot of the things we want to do as we continue to grow. So like one is upgrading equipment. We want to eventually move to 4K and things like that. So um, with your support, we can do that a lot faster than we would otherwise. So we're going to kind of see how this Patreon thing works out. We've got some cool perks and we also want to take your tasting on the road and visit manufacturers and uh, bring you even more footage and things like that too. So. We've got some cool goals. Check them out. We'll link to Patreon below. I'd love it if you can kick in a couple bucks a month and help support the channel for the videos we do here on Gear Tasting and otherwise. So thanks for watching.